let's go back to, to uh, I, uh, where I talk a little bit about the theory of this. So I told you what in practice is done. Uh, in theory, so, so, so in practice it doesn't really matter if your model is incomplete or complete. Because there is only one queue that the market uses. Okay, that's uh, the view. Uh, there is only one queue that the market uses, so you just estimate that queue. Even though there are many queues, many risk-neutral probabilities, there is only one which the market uses, and if you have enough data, you estimate that queue the way I just described. There is a problem if you are in a new market which, uh, which is, uh, doesn't have the data. Right? If you suddenly have the regulation, in, uh, like it was the case for energy markets, suddenly you have new derivatives on energy, electricity, and and you are new in this and there is no no it's a new market there is no history then you cannot do that there is no liquidly traded derivatives and then it's a hard problem okay then i don't have much to say about that it's a hard problem uh, to to choose which model and which parameters to to use if there are no liquidly traded options or derivatives all right going back to the to kind of a general uh, case with two Brownian motions. So suppose I put here two Brownian motions in S, but independent Brownian motions, so I need two to have correlation with this one. I put one in V. I could have done other way around, doesn't really matter. I could have put two Brownian motions in V and only one in S. Uh, but okay, I chose to put two Brownian motions, W1 and W2, which are independent in S and one Brownian motion in V, in the volatility, and then these sigmas in some way uh, depend on volatility, like in Heston's model it was square root of V, right? These functions were square roots. But in general you can have something like this. And this is under the actual so-called physical measure, probability. I want to show here that there are many possible Martingale probabilities. And I will just tell you how to construct them. Okay? So for any process kappa, which doesn't look into the future, so adapted process, you, you can construct a risk-neutral probability Q kappa. Okay? So there is really infinitely many, continuously infinitely many of those for any process kappa. What do you do? I'm just first going to look at the second equation here. You change W2 by adding kappa dt. Okay. What does this mean? This means really the integrated form as usual. It means that W2 q kappa of t is W2 of t uh, equals sign in between plus integral 0 to t kappa of s ds. That's what it means. Okay. The sum of theorem still holds. I can, I can change by integrals, not by multiplying by t, but I change by, by adding an integral like this. Okay, that's what I mean here. And then similarly for the w1, this part is the same as in Black-Scholes, mu minus r over sigma, except they may depend on time. In which case, I also mean something like this with the integral. I mean the integrated form. And then I also subtract sigma 2 kappa. All I want to do is to make my discount stock price a martingale, which means I want to replace mu by r here. Now, if you plug this dw1 here, sigma 1 and sigma 1 will cancel. Mu and mu will cancel. You will get your r here, but you will also get minus sigma 2 kappa. However, that will cancel when you replace the W2 with this one, because here you will have sigma 2 times kappa. So sigma 2 kappa and mi minus sigma 2 kappa will cancel. And you will have RDT here. So for any change, Gersano type of change or probability like this, you do get RDT plus some Martingales plus DW terms. So for any kappa, you have a Martingale probability. You have a risk-neutral probability. Okay, this is theoretically what's uh, going on in a model where you have two brand emotions and only one risky asset, and you only have to make one risky asset a martingale. You are not making the, the other one a martingale, discounted. Uh, then you have many ways to do that. Okay. 
And, and as I told you already in practice, you don't just uh, you make assumptions. In particular, you make assumptions typically like in Heston's model that this alpha and gamma and mu sigma one or kappa, if you want, you, you assume that they are constant. Okay, that's the easiest case. Uh, you assume that the, those parameters are constant, and then you estimate them from the market data, market options data. Okay, so if you do this change, you, you, wh what happens to V, you get uh, alpha minus kappa gamma in the drift, otherwise it stays the same. And I change W2 to W2Q. Right? And then you can write down a partial differential equation, similarly as before. Well, you can write the partial differential equation if you if you have constant parameters, or at least deterministic parameters, or parameters which are deterministic functions of your of your stochastic uh, factors here. If you introduce additional randomness, you may need additional uh, terms in your partial differential equation. Okay, but if you have constants, so you assume typically that you have constant parameters, and then you can write down your your partial differential equation, uh, same as before. This is standard derivative with respect to time. OK, now my, my total volatility is sigma 1 squared plus sigma 2 squared, because I had two branching motions in S. And then second derivative with respect to volatility, gamma squared. And then I have the drift terms. This is the Black-Scholes usual term. And then I have the drift of V under, under Q. And then I have um, the mixed term, okay, with the mixed second derivative times the, uh, in this case, sigma 2 gamma, because sigma 2 gamma was the correlation. If you look back, uh, if you look back, uh, I have gamma and, uh, and the sigma 2 multiplying dw2s. And then I get nothing from these two guys, W2 and W1, because they have a zero correlation. And these guys have a one correlation, one. Okay. So I just multiply gamma, sigma 2, S. That's where this term comes from. Actually, there is a typo here. S is missing. Right? There should also be an, should be also an S here. <coughs> OK, and then this paragraph uh, at the bottom tells you what I already told you, uh, you know, on that uh, blank slide, that you calibrate this, then you choose your, your alpha, kappa, gamma, uh, so that uh, you match as well as possible the observed market prices of liquidly traded options. Okay. okay uh, now there is another difficulty here, which is it's it's not you know your function your, your function c here as I said before is going to depend on t s and v and v is not as directly observable as s and s is just the stock price you see it time is also you know what time is what is volatility well that you have to estimate right so so it's a little bit tricky to to compute this, these prices also because they depend on something which is not quite directly observable, this volatility here. Uh, you have to, although these days it's much more better defined of what people think is volatility because they trade options on volatility. Okay, but that, that's, that's how you do it in stochastic volatility models. You write the model, you estimate, calibrate the parameters, you compute the price either as a solution to differential equation or by expected values. If it's a solution to differential equation, it uh, depends on time, on the underlying, and on the value, current value of volatility too. All right, that's it.